invite you to pray with me. Let's pray. Lord, we read in your word, God, that you are love. And that perfect love drives out fear. And so in this time and this morning, as we come to gather, as we've gathered here to worship you, to lift up your name in, in praise and in prayers, and as we come to this sermon, I ask and pray, Lord, that you would teach us from your word, that you would show us more and more your love for us. God, you know our stories. You know what we bring into this room. Some of us don't feel lovable. And God, we need to know that you haven't given up on us, that you never give up on us, that your faithfulness is true and real, and that your promises are true. And so, Lord, I ask that you would encourage us this morning, that you would build us up, that you would care for us, that you would give us your abiding, unconditional love. And may we hear about that love and experience that love in and through your word. And may we leave here different because you have met with us throughout this entire morning. We love you. We thank you. We commit ourselves to you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Well, as I mentioned earlier, we are beginning a new sermon series entitled, When God's People Love One Another. And right away, as we think about the idea of loving one another, we think of Jesus' words, some of his final words to his disciples before he went to be crucified. And in John 13, 34 and 35, he shared this with his disciples. He said this, a new command I give you. He said, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Jesus' command here is clear. He says to love one another, but how? How? He says to to love one another as he has loved them. And by us, by extension, as his disciples, as we have experienced his love, when then we are called and invited to love one another. And what's the outcome? One of the outcomes that Jesus says is that a watching world will know that we are his followers or disciples by how we love one another. And so in this Lent season, as we move into these days leading up to Good Friday and to Easter, This is our focus. What does it mean for us as God's people, as the family of God, the new family of Jesus, to love one another? And what does that look like? What does that feel like? How do we put this into practice? Because even as we just sang, right, all love, true love requires some kind of sacrifice. True love requires giving something up for the sake of another. And love is so much more than a feeling, right? Not just, oh, I love chocolate. I love when my sports team wins. It's It's action. It's doing something for the other, giving something up for the other, and serving and loving them. And we see that in the life of Jesus. And so in this series, we're going to be considering all the different ways that we can love one another that we see in the New Testament. Throughout the New Testament letters, there's a call from God to love one another. And these one another's are these commands of mutuality, saying, forgive one another, pray for one another, build one another up, spur one another on towards love good deeds. Right? All these one another's, we're going to be considering them. What do they mean? What's their significance? And how can we put them into practice? And for us together, as we can grow and put these one another's into practice, that my prayer is that for all of us, we would grow in our God-given ability to love well, to love more faithfully, and that we can learn to love in the way of Jesus. And so as Jesus gave this, this new command, why is it new? Right, for most of my Christian life, I kept thinking, well, this is nothing new. Is, I mean, love one another, it seems so basic, right? Aren't we? I mean, when Jesus was asked what's the greatest command, it was to love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then to love your neighbor as yourself. So why does Jesus say, a new, new command I give to you? Well, the newness comes from because of who he is and what he's done. Because he says, a new command I give to you. He says, love one another as I have loved you. And his disciples, when they heard that, They had a sense of how much Jesus loved them, but they didn't have the full extent of it because after he shared that command with them, shortly thereafter is when he went to the cross and he died for them and for you and for me on that cross for the forgiveness of their sins. Then the third day was resurrected to life and then the meaning and significance of that came to bear. But he says, love one another. A new command I give you is love one another as I have loved you with that sacrificial love. 
And so for, that, for these, this command, we need to look at the context. When did Jesus give this new command? Well, it's when the disciples were gathered with Jesus for a meal. And as they gathered with Jesus for this meal, something was missing. And that something was someone. And so we're going to look at this passage in John chapter 13, verses 1 through 17. If you've grown up in the church and you've been around the church, you no doubt have heard this account in this passage. My prayer for you is that you would enter into this and experience this moment of Jesus with his disciples in a new and fresh way. If you're newer to the church and you're visiting, you're checking out Christianity, trying to figure out God, trying to figure out life, and you've landed here in this room on this March 10th, 2019, I'm grateful you're here. My prayer for you is that you would also be able to engage into this story and account of Jesus and his disciples and see yourself in it. So here's how we're going to approach it. I'm going, yes, to read John 13, 1 through 17. If you are a visual learner, if you, if you learn by reading words, the words will be up on the screen. For others, maybe you're more audible learners or you ex- through experience in your imagination. For th- if you're like that, I invite you to close your eyes and simply listen to this account. But for all of us, I invite you to, for a moment here as you listen to this, put yourself into this story, into this account of Jesus and his disciples. Put yourself in that room and what, do you, what would you have seen? What would you have heard? What would you have felt? Even what would you have smelled? <laughs> Put yourself there and let's experience and see uh, what God has for us as we enter into this time with Jesus in this uh, tender moment with his disciples. So John 13, verses 1 through 17. Uh, Listen in as I take you into this room with his disciples. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and to go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, Are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, You do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. 
You could open your eyes if they were closed. All right, so imagine being in that room. Right? As a follower of Jesus, you've traveled with him for years. And you're at this meal, and you, you come, and, and it was the custom at that time, you would, if there was a meal that was prepared, or, and you came to a room like this, there should have been some form of servant there to wash your feet. And this servant wasn't someone who was on par with anyone else in the room. This would have been someone who was way, way below any form of status. In fact, not even a, 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 any form of Jewish person should not have been a servant to wash the feet. It would have been probably a non-Jewish person, a Gentile person. I mean, not even Jewish women and children were asked to play this role. This was to be someone who was an outcast of society. This was the worst of worst, because if you picture walking around the Near East with sandals or barefoot, the type of dust and dirt and grime that would just build up on your feet, and you would come in to the room to share a meal. When you'd share a meal, it wasn't like us. You'd sit around a table with you know, nice chairs and a table, and your feet are underneath the table. The custom of that time, and you still see it around the world now, is you'd come alongside of a, of a, of a slightly raised table, and you would lie down with your, almost like your elbow up, and you'd kind of eat laying on your side. I would demonstrate, but it would be kind of awkward, right? So you, you're on your side, and you eat. And since you're eating, everyone's feet are right around you. And so the custom was, yes, to have your feet washed, not just because of ceremonial pieces, but just practically, because... Last time I checked, what I smell is what I taste when I eat, right? So there was, that was a helpful piece. But there was no one there. We don't record what's going on in terms of the disciples' heads. I know if I was there, I'd be like, this is kind of awkward. We're about to eat. Dinner is going to smell like John's feet or Peter's feet. Kind of funny. So it was just really awkward in that moment. And so I'm wondering if they're thinking, who's going to wash the feet? Where's the servant? In the middle of this moment, Jesus gets up, right, takes off his outer clothing, wraps a towel around, gets a basin of water, pours it in and walks around to each disciple and washes their feet. What the disciples didn't know then is what Jesus was showing them was his identity and mission. And not only their identity, his identity and mission, but their identity and mission. Or first we see in verse 4, he says, it says that Jesus got up, you know, got up from the meal. That's when he took off his outer clothing and tied a towel around and went and washed the disciples' feet. And as he washed their feet after a bit, he then put his clothing back on and sat down and returned to his place. Do you see the significance there? Jesus, the Son of God, who is in heaven, left his place to come to be with us into this dirty, dusty, sin-infected world to cleanse us, to wash us, to make us clean, to restore us, and to make the way for us to be restored into a right relationship with God so that we could be adopted into God's family. That's what Jesus did for us, and he showed it through his washing of his disciples' feet. It's a powerful picture in verse 12 where it says that when he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place, his rightful place, which was a sign and symbol of what was going to happen, that he was going to ascend to be after his resurrection, ascend to be with the Father to his rightful place, sitting at the right hand of the throne of God, ruling and reigning. Jesus could have stayed far away. He could have stayed away from our dirty, dust-filled, sin-impacted world. And like the rest of the world's religions said, look down and said, come and submit to me. Follow all the rules and climb the ladder to me. No. The beauty of Christianity, the beauty of Jesus Christ and the gospel is that God stepped down into our dirty, dirt-filled, dusty, sin-infected world. Instead of being infected by sin, he brought cleansing and new life to us. And he did it out of his great love for us. True love requires sacrifice. Jesus sacrificed and gave up everything. As we read in Philippians chapter 2, he could have he considered equality with God something to have held on to and grasped, but he didn't. He took the form of a servant and died a death, even death on a cross. Or in 2 Corinthians 8 9, we read that though he was rich, he became poor, so that out of his poverty, we, you and me, we could become rich. 
Here, Jesus gives a powerful picture of washing his disciples' feet, leaving his place from the table to come wash and then return to his place. This showed his mission. This showed his identity. But he doesn't stop there. Then he, says what, he shows us our mission and our identity. Because in verses 12 through 17, he says, I've set you an example that you are to go and wash one another's feet. In essence, to love one another, to serve one another. See, what would have been expected would have been, the disciples would have been shocked. This unexplained, shocking move of Jesus, unexplainable, that he would have, he, the master, would have washed the disciples' feet. What's going on there? That shouldn't have been the case. So the response should have been that the disciples or the servants should then have washed his feet. So they would have expected Jesus' teaching, saying, I've washed your feet now, it's your turn to wash mine, but not Jesus. Jesus always takes what's expected. And right when you think something's going to happen, a, a line of teaching, he shifts it. And he, what he shifts is, instead of us washing his feet, he says, wash one another's feet. Love one another. Serve one another. He says, and by doing this, in verse 17, he says, you will be blessed if you do this. You'll be blessed if you do this. So this is the context of Jesus' words when he said, love one another. Just as I have loved you, love one another. And he put that on display through this foot washing. This is how God's love flows to us, and not just to us, but through us to one another. Right? This is how we establish and maintain healthy relationships in the new family of Jesus or the church. Or in other places in Scripture, it's, we're called the body of Christ. Think about the human body. Right? With, the, with the heart pumping inside and the circulatory system, right? it pumps out blood to all the different parts of the body. And these blood cells go out bringing oxygen and nutrients and brings health to the body. And as that blood flows to the body, it keeps the body together. It's unified. It, it heals the body and allows the body to, to grow and be healthy. I believe it's a picture of the body of Christ. And when Jesus says, love one another, it's like the blood flow of the body. As our heart pumps, it's like the love of God's given to us and it flows through us. Us as we love one another in the body of Christ, that's how we can experience unity, healing, and growth. So what are the barriers or blockages? Right? If you think about the human body, it's never a good thing when the blood flow is blocked, right? That's where strokes occur, heart attacks. And so what are those blockages? What gets in the way? We see a picture here in this passage. But what blocks us from loving one another? A, a really easy example would be someone who's simply unloving. Someone who is selfish by nature, right? Is, who is unwilling or refuses to love others. They only love themselves. That's an easier one to pick out. But a less easier one to pick out is maybe another blockage in that blood flow or that flow of love is someone who's unwilling to accept love. Someone who's will, unwilling to accept grace or a gift. Maybe it's out of pride, right? Saying, hey, I don't, I, don't, I don't want that gift. If I get that gift or if I get that love from another person, then, then that means I have to actually give it back. And, and maybe it's someone who wants to maintain control in their lives or maybe someone blocks receiving a gift because they feel unworthy. Maybe they feel like, I don't deserve this gift and I don't want it. Well, think about Peter, right? Jesus comes to Peter and he's gonna wash his feet. And Peter's reply, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? This is an offense to Peter. Peter thinking, there's no way Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, he should be, Peter's thinking, I should be washing his feet, not the other way around. But I think there's something deeper inside Peter, something that's resisting Jesus, resisting his love, resisting his grace. There's something inside that's blocking Peter from receiving what Jesus has to offer him. But Jesus breaks through that blockage. He breaks through that barrier. And Peter eventually says, okay, wash me. Of course, wash all of me. And there's deeper teaching in that, that Jesus says, look, you've already been cleansed. Right? I've cleansed you. You're, you're mine. But you still need your foot washed. You need your feet washed. Yes, because of the dirt and grime that's in the world, but of the sin that we experience. So what does this mean for me? As I think about Peter, as I think about all this foot washing and loving one another. And if I'm honest with you, I could be like Peter. I can be like Peter. If I'm honest, I can find myself resisting God's love and grace in my life. It seems strange as a pastor, right, that 
But it's interesting. It's not so much if it comes directly from God. Like if I'm seeking God's love and God's grace, I feel like I can connect with him directly. But when it comes to other people, if I've been honest with God, I've, I'm wondering how well I receive love from other people. Do I resist that love for a variety of reasons? How did I come to this conclusion? There's a, a mentor of mine. His name is Sam Hughes. He's also a spiritual director of mine. His wife, Tina, has been a mentor of Laurie for years, going all the way back to Laurie right after college. And Sam, we had a chance to visit with him this, a couple summers ago during my sabbatical. And Sam told me about uh, a set of exercises that he does to help people grow in their faith. And, and it goes back to Ignatius of Loyola. And these Ignatian exercises are a, a specific way that to give someone a passage of Scripture um, in the Gospels and to imagine being there with the disciples. Imagine being there with Jesus. Like I gave you a taste of before to imagine saying, what do you feel? What do you think? What are you sensing? What are you experiencing? And <clears throat> just a couple weeks ago, as God would have it, it was this passage. And as I went through John 13 and put myself in that room with the disciples, it was so interesting. I mean, just give you a window into my, my mind and my heart. I mean, as I was imagining, here's Jesus coming to wash my feet. And I was very welcome to that. Wow, Jesus, here you are. Imagine that. Imagine Jesus coming and just like a friend washing your feet and washing my feet. That was an amazing experience in my mind. But then when he said, he turned to everyone and said, now I've set you an example. You are to wash one another's feet. And I looked around the room at the other disciples in my imagination. I thought, do I really want these guys to wash my feet? I'm willing to wash their feet. I'll give to them, but am I willing to let them wash my feet? And then I thought about others in my life. Am I willing to allow others to love me, to wash my feet? Am I willing to trust them right, with the dirt of my life? Because it only takes one person, right? You share something vulnerable with someone and then they take advantage of it. Maybe gossip about you behind the scenes or hopefully not share it out directly on social media right away. But it takes just one moment when you're vulnerable. And if I'm honest with you, I'm honest with myself. If, during that moment, I thought, am I really willing to allow others to love me well? And starting with my wife, with Laurie. Am I willing to really be open with her and share everything with her? I should, she's my wife. But what about other friends, other people? This is what God's been showing me as I've been reflecting on this. Um, but the good news is that in the middle of it, I've started to ask God to interrupt that approach. What would it look like? Now, Lori's been amazing. She's invited me to share openly with her all aspects of my life, and she's shown me the grace of God. There's so many things that I thought, if I share these things with her, will she still love me? as my wife? Will she still accept me, let alone my friends? Others in this church, I want to thank you at points where you have loved me well, especially the last couple of years with some very difficult times. I mean, Jesse Atkinson, right there, when he comes up and says, how are you doing, Pasta?" <laughs> and I say, I'm doing well. He goes, really? And he means it. And I feel like when I can share something with him that he could hold that. So Jesse, thank you. And Laura, your patience with me. I'm a piece of work. Thank you. For others in other circles, it's, yeah, I'm getting vulnerable. I'm even sweating. The fact that, um, so I don't know where you are in this. What does this mean for you? Because if we think about this, the only way we can entrust ourselves to another person is if we really believed we're loved by God to the core of our being. Amen. Right? If we believe that we are loved and accepted, right? that no matter what we've done, no matter what dirt is on our feet, that Jesus still decided to come down into this dirty, dusty, sin-infected world and to wash our feet and to cleanse us. And he gave his life on a cross. He didn't have to do it, but he sacrificed his life. He died for our sins, and he was resurrected to life on the third day, overcoming all of that sin. He did that out of his love for you and for me. If we could believe that to the core of our being, if I could believe that to the core of my being, and you know what? We could be free with each other. We don't have anything to prove. We don't have to prove ourselves anymore to anyone. 
And if we could offer each other grace, if we could offer each other acceptance, if we could offer each other listening ears, recognizing that we're all struggling, that we're all on level ground and common ground in Christ. Amen? We are all on level ground and on common ground. We all need grace. We all need love. We all need to have our feet washed. We need that full first, that full bath from Jesus, that cleansing to come into the family of God. And then we need that ongoing foot washing. Because every day as we walk through this dusty, dirty, sin-infected world, we pick up all kinds of dirt. But the promise of God is that he'll wash our feet and that he uses each other, that we can wash each other's feet. As we love each other, as we're there for each other, as we listen for each other, listen to each other, as we pray for one another, as we offer forgiveness to one another, all the one another's that we're going to consider in the, in the upcoming weeks, we could experience the love of Christ and that cleansing that we all desperately, desperately need. I know I need it. And so this is the good news of Jesus. This is the basis of that true unity in Christ, the basis of true healing in Christ, the basis of true growth in Christ. And God wants to provide that restoration for us, restoration in love and life and in Christ. It's available to us. So as we finish, I want to give a couple, couple of applications. Uh, we mentioned this last week, and it's been going out that, um, that we're starting in the next, for these next weeks ahead um, to be offer up opportunities to pray together, to become part of a prayer triad, a group of three that simply prays frequently for one another, um, ideally meets once a month, once this month in March, once next month in April before Easter. And to begin, I was joking with someone in the atrium, it's not like you come to each other and share your deepest, darkest sin right away. It's simply just to get to know each other and to pray for each other and to see what God does with that. And our prayer and desire as a church staff is that this would allow for greater fellowship and connections within our church. And so if you're interested, if you haven't signed up yet, I invite you to take out that connection card that's near your chair. And again, on the back in the prayer section, yes, please put down prayer requests. And if you want to be still part of a prayer triad, write down your name and just write the word triad. And we'll get them into the office and we'll set you up with a prayer triad from now until Easter. And then you can pray and decide if you want to keep going after Easter, but it's a great way to simply form a connection. And when, you're, when you form that triad, we'll give you a full one-page description, questions and answers of how to best enter into this so you're not left without instruction. That's one way. Another way in the coming weeks to help engage in what I've talked about here is, is through a new way of doing devotions. We've been doing daily devotions for years. And uh, we decided for this season to kind of scale back, not to overload you with information, but to simplify and I know we'd like to spend a little less time behind a computer and more or less more time with people. And so on Saturday is going to be a setup for worship. You'll get a description of what's coming the next morning on worship. On Monday will be a summary of the, of, the, of the sermon and a set of questions that you can engage in as an individual, as a family, or in a group. Perhaps with your prayer triad. It's a great way to engage with your prayer triad on those questions. And then Wednesday or Thursday will come some type of personal reflection from the person who shared the message that week to help you go deeper. And so I encourage you in the weeks ahead, as we engage in these one another's of Scripture, enter into a prayer triad, engage in these devotions. If you're not receiving them, simply send an email to info at restorationrva.org. Get the devotions and engage. And for us together to grow together, what it means to love one another. Jesus said, love one another as I have loved you. And then he said, if you do this, the world will know that you are my disciples. So let's engage in loving one another through the one another's in the weeks ahead. I'm going to pray for us, and as I pray, we're also going to pray for the offering. And so after uh, I'm finished, the ushers will come forward, receive the offering. During that time, I invite you to, to yeah, drop these connect cards into the offering baskets as they pass by. Let's pray together. Let's pray. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, Thank you for your awe-inspiring, incredible love that we ultimately see in Jesus, your son, who didn't stay far away, who came to be with us in this dirty, dusty, sin-infected world. And in doing so, he, did, he gave away his life so we could be cleansed and cleaned and welcomed into your family forever. Thank you for Jesus. I pray for every person here. I pray that they would know the depths of your love for them no matter what they've done, who they are and, where, and what they're going through, God, that they would know that you love them 
unconditionally and immensely. And that this season leading up to Good Friday and Easter would be a time for them to experience your love in a fresh and new way. And God, as a church, as we engage in loving one another, that you would grow our love for one another through this season. And may we rely on your grace to do it. We can't just generate this, Lord. We need your strength. We need your grace to do it. So we give ourselves to you. We seek to surrender ourselves to your love afresh this season, thanking you for your great love for us.